All right, how you doing? I've got the little Madonna microphone on. <laughs> got to figure out what to do with my hands. Maybe I should wear a guitar. I'm more confident behind a guitar. It's a crutch. I love it. <laughs> All right. I'm going to read this little uh, essay I wrote on the plane the other day about the power of a song. <clears throat> A good song is like a story that gets inside your skin, that works and weaves its way into your own story. The best songs seem to stray from their masters and come to live with you. Over time, it's as if you wrote it yourself, like the scent that recalls an old fling or the smell of the house you grew up in. A song can teleport you into a moment in time when you were another person. They can often recall emotions, feelings you long forgot you felt, there are even times a song can come to you in the darkness and remind you of who you really are. You hear a sound, a piano, a string, a vocal, a person you've long forgotten can resurface. An essay can approach you in the moment. <clears throat> A lecture can present ideas and concepts to be considered in an intellectual manner, but a song offers you something more. A song offers you a response. For this reason, a song can mold you and inform you for years. Few people remember what the pastor said during their wedding ceremony, but everybody remembers what was playing at the first dance. I remember the song from my first dance. It was This Year's Love by David Gray. It better last. It's high time. <laughs> and it did. 10 years. Is my wife in here? Oh, man. It's going to honor my wife. This is going to win me some points. I remember the song from, from my first dance, This Year's Love by David Gray. I remember the song at my best friend's funeral. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. I remember the song that was playing when my oldest son was born. <laughs> it was also Praise the Lord, oh my soul by Kevin Brush. I remember the song we played when we drove him home from the hospital, Hey Jude, the Wilson Pickett version. I remember seeing Coldplay with a thousand people. They opened with Politic and destroyed everything I knew about music at the time. I remember seeing Ryan Adams when he released Cold Roses and crawled across the stage. He sang a whole song with a cigarette in his mouth and sang perfectly. <laughs> and they were not playing to a click track, so there were no tracks. It was all him. I remember seeing Bon Iver right after he released the self-titled album. I saw Springsteen twice at Time Warner Arena. When Clarence played the sax solo to, uh, <laughs> when Clarence played the sax solo to Thunder Road, I cried actually a little bit. I mean, I, I did. <laughs> the timber of Bob Marley's voice is permanently etched in my brain. As he sang, redemption songs is all I ever had. It's the last song he sang publicly before he passed away. Frank Sinatra's version of My Way breaks my heart. I hear a man struggle for greatness against elements that he cannot possibly overcome. The timeless melody Paul McCartney sings in Yesterday. I heard a thousand people sing, you're never giving up on me. When Johnny Helser recorded his first record, I remember Don Potter singing Show Me Your Face with an acoustic guitar and watching 4,000 people melt. I remember the first time I heard Martin Smith sing Open Up the Doors, and all of a sudden I was validated. The things I knew in my heart but didn't know how to say, I could shout from the window of my car. These are the songs that make up who I am, that give me context for who I am. A song is so much more than a way to transfer information. It's a way to share life. 
Music brings context to the lives, the lives we live. Music doesn't show us what to see as much as it frames and colors the way we see it. Writing a worship song is a profound way of sharing your life with God the Father, other believers, and if you do it right, even pre-believers. If we reduce a song to a message, we lose the unique power of the song. Its ability to become part of, of you and mold who you become long-term is inhibited. For too long, music has been viewed as the warm-up or the icing on the cake and not the cake itself. So what, what is a song? I took music theory for a minute, which you won't know by listening to my music, <laughs> right? But I took music theory for a minute. My music theory teacher told me this. She said, the technical definition of music is sound and silence organized. Sound and silence organized. So, okay, everyone knows what a sound is, but even children know what music is. My kids have danced at a young age. No one ever taught them or showed them. If I start clapping, my daughter will dance. If we start singing, my daughter will dance. She recognizes music. So we know what a noise is, you know, like the air conditioner or the refrigerator, and we know what music is, but at what point does lightning strike Frankenstein's monster and the noise and the sounds turn into a song? Where does that happen? You know, I've thought about this a lot, and I think I have an idea and it has to do, believe it or not, with praise. C.S. Lewis, this is a really great little book, Reflections on the Psalms by C.S. Lewis, and I've absolutely destroyed this book. I love it, I quote it all the time. Um, but C.S. Lewis, he, he said for, a long, for the longest time he had this problem with, uh, with certain parts of the Psalms and certain aspects of praise, and his problem was this, is that why did God seem to demand that we praise him? And it really bothered him because the rest of scripture didn't seem to support God as this sort of like um, insecure person who needed us to affirm him. The rest of scripture didn't paint him in that light until he realized something. God wasn't commanding us to praise him the way a dictator or some insecure person commands people around them to affirm them and speak good things about them. God commands praise the way the mountains command to be looked at. He commands praise the way, the way good art demands praise. It will not be passed by. And he said this, I think we delight to praise what we enjoy because the praise is not, not merely expresses but completes the enjoyment. It is the appointed consummation. It is not out of compliment that lovers keep telling one another how beautiful they are. The delight is incomplete till it is expressed. It is frustrating to have discovered a new author and not be able to tell anyone how good he is. To suddenly come at the turn of the road upon some mountain valley of unexpected grandeur and then to have to keep silent because the people with you care for it no more than for a tin can in a ditch. The human organism has got to praise. You're going to praise. You don't get a choice. Praise is who you are. You're born to give a voice to great things. The only thing you get to choose is what you praise. But you're going to praise. You're going to give a voice to the things that you think are great. And so in music, I believe the difference in noises and sounds and music is the fact that music has this human intention or emotion or heart attached to it that you can sense through those sounds. Noise becomes music when there's a human intent, emotion, or heart connected to it. I believe that a song has almost always been a way that we share life. If praise is me giving voice to something I think is great among the people, right? Because that's what C.S. Lewis is basically saying, is you have to share something with someone else or you can't fully enjoy it and embrace it. 
This, I, don't know, I don't know how this is gonna go over, but I thought about this the other day. If I gave you $20 million, I give you $20 million, but I said, I will give you $25 million if you won't say anything about it to anybody ever. I'll give you 20 million, you can do whatever you want, or I'll give you 25, but you can't say anything about it. How many people will go with the 20? You give up $5 million because you can't not express, you cannot enjoy that $5 million if you can't share it. It doesn't mean anything to you. And your life means nothing to you if you can't share it. And God means very little to you if you can't share it. It, him. Well, I believe that a song has always been a way to share life. It's the way we commune, have common union. Our hearts communicate. All those words have to do with us having something in common. It's a way to have some sort of cosmic fellowship with people who find something in common. To be in accord, to live in harmony, to be sympathetic. These are musical words because this is what we do in music and song. We throw out ideas and emotions in the hope that we will find a response. We sing to know that we're not alone. So what does this have to do with songwriting? It has everything to do with songwriting. There are four basic components to a song. The most important is the melody. The next one is a lyric, and the third one is a rhythm. But I was wrong. There's actually one that's more important than any one of those three. The most essential element to a song is you. The most essential element to a song is you. If there's not a human heart present in your song, then your song is noise. If there's not love in your song, then you're a banging cymbal, you know, the whole spiel. I'm also convinced that if you're not in it, Jesus doesn't want it. Worship is not simply reciting facts that Jesus already knows about himself. Jesus is not interested in the facts. Number one, our facts are almost always at least a little bit wrong. <laughs> Number two is he knows better about it than you do. He knows theology better than you do. So singing theology, he's not impressed by you singing theology to him. He also, you know, he says he's got cattle on a thousand hills, and if he was hungry, he wouldn't let you know. He's not impressed, and you have nothing to offer him other than yourself. And so if our songs do not contain us, then God, I'm convinced, isn't interested in them. He doesn't need your knowledge or theology. He wants you. I thought how ridiculous it'd be for me to compose a song about facts about my wife and how much they sound like some worship songs. Her shoes are size eight. She's allergic to fish. I pray that she never has fish on her plate. It's stupid. That's just the facts. That's how we sing about God all the time. God, you're good, wonderful. You did this, you did that. I don't care. <laughs> I hope this appeases you and you're not mad at me anymore for all those things I did before I was saved. You know? That's when praise becomes an obligation, it, ce it ceases to be praise. You have to want to do it or it doesn't work. 